I don't think we can predict the future course of biology, except in that it will be driven by wildly creative individuals. One of the things that I think is great about Whitehead is that you make your own path. There's tremendous support for trying something new and crazy. I've been doing that all my career. I've never gone down a trodden path. I wanted to find a new organism that would allow one to take a genetic approach to the problem of regeneration. Yeah, I want an organism that can regenerate you know, a new head in a week. I want an organism that can regenerate its entire body from a tiny fragment. But evolution has already selected for mechanisms that can accomplish these tasks. Obvious implications for understanding of multicellular biology and obvious implications for regenerative medicine. How do they do it? It might sound odd to find someone that's working on plants at a biomedical institute, but the gene regulation mechanism that I'm studying now has a lot to do with the immune response. Plants use this mechanism to control their own gene expression, but they also use this mechanism as a defense response against viruses to control virus gene expression. And it turns out that this particular pathway has also been linked to uh, controlling genes that are uh, suppressors or enhancers of cancer. So it's just very exciting that at such a fundamental level you can make discoveries that are, that are important in you know, application and what you're doing actually matters. <laughs> For me, it's all about the magic of the embryo. I love to think about how an embryo goes from a single cell to a complex multicellular animal like ourselves. And what we've been looking at over the last couple of years is a very complex question of how the brain forms its proper structure and how its proper structure is related to its proper function. Zebrafish are particularly terrific for looking at things like brain development because they're transparent. You can look down into the brain as it forms in real time at a single cell resolution and you can see all the nerve cells growing out and making their connections. If you understand how the brain is normally built, then you can look at a brain disorder. For example, we're interested in autism and we can say, well, what's gone wrong in those brains? And I think that that's actually the bottom line. You cannot understand disease or disorders or think about therapies for those without understanding the normal process. Biology is the science of our times. There's no doubt about that. But we don't have all the bases covered. We have a total of 15 faculty and five fellows in the entire institute. And we see that as a strength. Each of us could be residing in a university or a department elsewhere where we would be surrounded by people whose focus is barely different from our own. And this would have tremendous practical benefit, but it wouldn't invite the kind of creative leaps that result when there are huge spaces intellectually between you and your neighboring laboratory. It is the sort of random collision of people working in very different arenas in biology that makes for the strength of the white identity. I never thought that I was going to be working in a lab <laughs> next to someone that works on chicken. <laughs> it's just the right size to allow people to know one another, to exchange ideas, to be comfortable with one another. And it's this conversation, this kind of exchange of knowledge that really makes research move forward. We have created a sociology of science here where people are constantly, on an hourly and daily basis, talking with everyone else in the institution. I know from my own experience that the best ideas don't come from the doddering old leaders of research labs. They come from the young people when I'm not looking over their shoulder and when they're able to come up with schemes that the oldsters would never think of. From the outside, you think the Whitehead being a super high pressure environment where people are not really friendly and they really just you know work completely on their own and you know they push you away if you want to see what they're doing so I'm, I'm looking but everybody's just incredibly friendly incredibly open i have ongoing collaborations with people in the genish lab in rick young's lab it's something very very exciting to be able to interact daily with these people it's fun you think you know something 
but then you discover another layer of complexity. Science is really a creative process. It's definitely not following exactly a predetermined path or the most expected route that will lead to a safe answer. No, no, no. We have a group of people that are working on incredibly different things and you can never really predict the ways in which they're going to interact or generate new kinds of thinking. I'm continually impressed that they've stuck to the mission of bringing in people who are always uh, right on the edge of the next frontier. The role of the Whitehead is to have a sense of where those next big areas of exploration are going to be and then to wander into them and explore all these different aspects of what might be in there. But being completely comfortable with the fact that they have no idea where this could ultimately take us. That's what Whitehead does. In the world of science, in the world of biology, most biologists follow a straight line path that was laid down by their predecessors. But I think it's terribly important that we let the individual creative mind set priorities that are motivated by the desire to understand how biological systems work. We really embrace the idea that curiosity is a sufficient justification to pursue the question. When you watch something happen, um, like an animal regenerating a new, a new head, I mean, it, it sort, of, uh, sort of excites the imagination. And that's the process of discovery. That's where unexpected findings emerge from, is sort of curiosity-driven experimentation. I don't know what we're going to find, but I'm sure it's going to be exciting. <laughs>